Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jesse Lee. I'm the Assistant General Manager at our Lonsdale Ranch, and I will be your host today. We'll be discussing how we at Blue Shore Financial can help you build a lifelong legacy to ensure you and your family's financial health and success. I want to acknowledge that Blue Shore Financial is on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh nations, and I come with respect for this land that we are on today and for the peoples who have and do reside here. I want to encourage everyone to initiate and continue to learn when it comes to our history and what it means to live on Indigenous land today. A good place to start is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, The Call to Actions, which you can find on our BC Provincial website. I'm delighted to introduce our two speakers today, Philip Brown, a senior financial advisor with over 25 years of experience in financial planning, and Andre Gillamet, our wealth protection specialist with over 15 years of experience in the field. Before we start, I'd like to remind you of some housekeeping items. This webinar will be recorded, and as an attendee, you are in listen-only mode. So if you have any questions, please utilize our Q&A box at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. These questions are only shared with the speakers. Now, if you haven't noticed already, this presentation display is highly customizable, so feel free to adjust your different screens to best suit your needs. Last but not least, please don't hesitate to engage and interact with us, whether that's in our Q&A box, as mentioned earlier, partaking in our polls throughout our webinar, or completing our survey at the very end. We would love to have your feedback on our webinar today. Now, what valuable information can you expect to receive from our two experts today? We'll talk about what investing in your family can look like in detail, how to grow, and just as importantly, protect your wealth based on you and your family's needs, as well as how to build your legacy to share with your loved ones. We'll reserve some time at the end of our webinar to answer questions that have come through our Q&A box. And if we don't get to all the questions, we will follow up with you afterwards. Now, before we invite Phil, I'm curious to know, what is the biggest financial concern for your family? I'll give you a few moments to select with your cursor what weighs on you the most. We'll give you a few more moments to select. Now, it's clear that both housing as well as saving and investing enough for retirement is a top concern for us, especially when we live in a beautiful city like Vancouver. Now, both Andre and Phil will be walking us through each of these items and addressing these concerns and how we can better future-proof our family and ourselves. Now, I'd like to hand the slide over to Phil, who will share his insight on what investing on your family realistically looks like. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to discuss a little bit about investing in your family now. And I just want a quick um, reminder that oftentimes we associate mm -hmm. this with with financial issues. And I'd also like to say, it's not just about financial issues. It's being a, a good role model. It's teaching our kids well. And these are just as important as the financial side of it. So one of my passions in my practice is the term financial literacy. And so it means a lot of things to a lot of people. But in reality, it's, it's how we communicate with family members about our finances. Um, it's not uncommon if your family of origin never spoke about finances, um, you probably don't either. 
or at least you might do it less than you would like to. And so one of the things about, about discussing the family and balancing those checks and balances, balancing the money coming into the family and the money coming out of the family, is you can have a really great holistic plan, a, a holistic discussion with your kids um, or with family members um, about what it takes to, to be involved in terms of the money and, and stuff. And I went up my family, for example, um, Ann and I, my sister, got started off very early in life with my dad telling me sort of how much things cost. And it was about, you know, you, you can't afford this, you can't afford that for very reasons. And so at the end of the day, and I know this goes back a little bit, but the, the agreement in our family was that if, if Ann and I could come up with half of the money for something we wanted, my parents would pay the remainder of it. And so what it really did is it gave me a very baseline for learning the value of money. And so that brings us to the, the question I'm going to ask you to think about during this seminar is what does money mean to you? Um, is it something that just is for transactions or is it something that's very personal and you like to keep it close to you? Because it's very important that if you identify that, it will explain and help you when you're dealing with your kids or family members about finances. The next one is education savings. And again, um, a lot of kids want to go to school. School isn't cheap anymore. In fact, it's the highest inflationary uh, part of the economy. It, it, it goes up about 15 to 20 percent per year. And so you need to start saving early and discussing with family members early about saving for education. And again, we're going to show you a few little products that we have that will help you um, and your kids um, save for future education purposes. And the final one, and I think you know, if you live on the Lower Mainland, certainly in the North Shore, uh, I'm sure there's been a discussion already with your family about paying for a first home or getting a first home. Again, there's some new products out there. We're going to share that with you in a few minutes. But we're also also having a discussion about how do we how do we discuss with our kids or our family members how we can develop a down payment for the property and how we can can maintain and understand the ongoing expenses when you purchase a property. Um, so the next slide says teach your children well. And again, the financial literacy issue, I think is just an amazing part to start with your kids. Um, it really is teaching your kids about, uh, you know, sort of the, the development between, sa the difference between savings, spending, and saving money maybe to forgiving. And so one of the big issues with that is we, we seem to think our kids um, do get the information at school, but in fact, it's, it's very tertiary. And I think it's really important as parents or as adults to share a bit of your knowledge of, of the financial area. Um, that is about balancing your budget, you know, dealing with some setbacks. If something doesn't go your way financially, what do you do to get back on your feet again? Um, budgeting, you know, we all, we all have to live within a budget. Um, we certainly know the current generation is more of a spending generation than the previous one. And so it's even more important for them to understand why they should start saving at this point. Um, you know, tracking spending, that's another great one. Building your credit score. Um, you know, when I was growing up, credit score wasn't really something we, we, we focused on, but now it's really important if there's going to be lending down the road that your kids understand the dangers of, of, of not paying credit and the effect it might have on their credit score. And of course, making sure they understand what a checking savings account is and how it works. Um, and the final one, which is, a, which is also a new one uh, in, in the market is credit cards, because cer certainly everybody's got a credit card now. And I think um, there's an understanding out there that you know these will all eventually get paid back. But sometimes when you're younger, um, you can get in a, a little bit over your head. And I think that's a really good role model for kids explaining to them sort of finances in general. Um, and it might actually help you too with your finances. That that relationship, that discussion, uh, may open up even more avenues for you and your kids to have a discussion about finances, and and that would lead to education and first home purchases. Again, retirement and financial planning really critical parts that need to be started earlier in your life, um, and that goes goes for anybody actually. I mean, certainly uh, a, a young a young kid will get involved in the banking type of products. But for, as you get older, you want to start to understand is, you know, what value am I? What is my plan? What does it look like down the, down the road? So really with financial um, retirement planning and financial planning, you're really the key is to start early, to start as early as you possibly can. Um, start saving a little bit, um, dollar cost average. Um, and again, this is a great place 
um, to, to talk to a, a Blue Shore advisor about, because they can certainly um, bring a baseline to you and explain what the opportunities and advantages of doing certain, certain paths are for you. Um, and it just makes it easier because you've got someone you can chat about and maybe explore different ideas. And the final one is a wish bank. And I think we all might have had one of these at one point. Um, for me, it was a savings, a piggy bank. And really, the, the, the wish bank is all about learning how to save, um, you know, how to save money for spending, and also how to save money for further giving. And it's a, it's a good way to show kids that you need a bit of a balanced approach when it comes to saving money. Um, so this is a, 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 an important slide that a lot of people may have seen um, many times before, and it's the power of compounding. And this really talks to the point of starting savings earlier. So really, it, th this slide really refers to the ability to invest on a regular basis um, and then grow the, the growth that's in the portfolio. So for example, if you take a GIC and you keep it for a few years, every year there's going to be interest on it. And the next year that interest will also grow. And so the whole idea here is not to take money out, to start with an amount that you can possibly deal with without a problem, without having to go after it. And then continue to do this for as long as you possibly can. And this seems this is a very simple way of building your growth and building your net worth um, by doing dollar cost averaging and certainly using the power of compounding. And again, this, this is something we use regularly in our practice, in the, in the advisory practice, just showing people how to save on a regular basis, which, which I think is really important to make sure that we've got a plan down the road, um, at least uh, when it comes to retirement and knowing, um, knowing where we might stand with regards to that. As this is a legacy issue, you really kind of want to know, can I leave a legacy? Uh, and what does that legacy look like? So we're going to move from thinking about how you deal with your kids, how you deal with family members and discussing, um, discussing maybe financial things to actually financial instruments that we have to help your kids. The first one is the RESP. So this is a re, um, an educational savings plan. It is, it is, it's federally regulated. And, and very quickly, I don't want to go into too many details of this. It allows you to save about $50,000 um, on a yearly basis, the, the, the contribution should be around $2,500. Um, the, there's a CSE grant, CSG grant, which the government provides, that on that $2,500, you're going to get $500 put into the account for you, free money, essentially. Um, you can change beneficiaries on this. So if one of the kids doesn't want to go to school or doesn't want to continue on in higher education, um, the, the RESP is not lost on you. You can do it in a family situation or simply an individual that may be one person in your family that will absolutely go to college. And the product can be open for 35 years. So for people that maybe didn't do the education that they were hoping to do when they're younger, there's the ability to use this as we get older, to use it to make sure we've got enough money to go back to college or take, a, take one or two courses um, for educational purposes. The reason we bring this up is this is something you can help your kids contribute to. Um, you can help them with their yearly uh, contribution, and uh, you will know that you're saving something in a, in a registered plan for your kids' education. The next one is the tax-free savings account, and it's exactly as it says it is. Money going into the tax-free savings account is after-tax money. It's money in your pocket, so there's no tax advantage to putting it in the tax-free savings account, but all money and all growth in the tax-free savings account can be pulled out tax-free. Um, very quickly, a couple little items. There's uh, currently, if you've never contributed to a TFSA, um, you can contribute up to $88,000. The average yearly contribution, which is set by the feds in usually about November or December, is about $6,500. Um, you never lose your limit. So if you need all the money out this year for a particular reason, um, you can put it all back in again January 1st of the next year. Um, and again, it's a federal government plan, so it is certainly um, it's, a, it's a plan that you know specific uh, controls are on. And so this is another area that you can help your kids or family members help contribute to their tax-free savings account. Help them build a reserve of cash in order to pay for things like education or possibly pay for, for finding a new home. 
Um, later on, and not, not too far later on, we're going to bring in Andre to talk about some new insurance products and how insurance now really is a huge part of a lot of Canadians' retirement and, and um, legacy plan and estate planning. And so once I bring in um, Andre, he will show us a few of those great products that are now available. And finally, the alternatives. And, and if, you're, if you're in a family that possibly does not have the, the huge deposits in an account and maybe you know, sort of living day to day, if you're a North Shore person, you probably never expected your homes to grow uh, from a growth point of view so much as you did in the last 10 years. Um, but you may not have a lot of cash. You may be you know, asset rich and cash poor, and that's not a problem. It's very typical. Um, one of the alternatives is something like a line of credit with, a, with, with Blue Shore. Another would be is if you really don't have a lot of income, you can't, you can't support a lot of income, would be something like a chip mortgage. And the reason you would do these is this will allow you, while you're alive, while you're living in your home, to contribute further funding to the family. And again, any advisor at Blue Shore would love to be able to have this discussion with you and walk through some of the, the benefits and the pros of doing this for you and your family. So, so the, next, the next slide is probably one of the big ones that we've, we see recently, and that is around um, home ownership. Um, I'm gonna go quickly go through these just so we can cover them, but really the first one is gifting. There's no tax in gifting in Canada. There's no, there's no estate tax this way. So by giving, gifted money from your account to your kid's account or, or your family account. Um, there's no tax event that occurs. This is simply money out of your pocket into the pocket of your family members. The real question is how much and when do I want to do this? Can I do it? Do I have enough money to do it? Um, will that affect my financial plan? Do I have a financial plan? Um, because of course, when you start to give out money um, before retirement planning comes into place, am I hurting myself down the road? And I always very quickly think, of being on an airplane and you know it's the, the oddest things when they say there's decompression in the cabin they say you know the 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 the, uh, the masks come down and they say make sure you put yours on first and it's interesting because when you, when you really think about that until you save yourself you really can't save anybody else and so gifting is a great idea it allows open communication and it really sets expectations up in a in a in a great environment but it also may impact your retirement plans Loans. So again, loans, um, unlike gifting, which you cannot get back, it is a gift. Uh, loans may involve a contract. Um, it may involve um, maybe even registering on a title of a property if you decide to help your kids. Um, you also may be a guarantor on that loan. So you won't be on title, but you are ready and willing to support should there be financial trouble with the family in terms of paying the mortgage. And so that's another idea. Um, part of that is being a co-signer as well, but a co-signer, you will go on on property title. And again, these may sound very complicated, but talk to an advisor about it, because simply these are great regularly used um, ideas to help our kids get into home ownership. Again, like I said, in a loan, there'll be a loan contract repayment. So the, the expectation is that you'll have some control of the money coming back to you. And this is maybe an idea if you know that's going to be tight in your retirement planning that you can do a loan now that you expect to get back over a period of time from your kids. Co-ownership, that really is purchasing a property with a family member. So you'll be on title. Um, therefore, there's the, when you're on title, um, the, the, maybe the child or the family member can declare that as their primary residence, which is a tax benefit. However, there are some, some challenges to that. And that's if, if someone dies, um, how does the ownership of the property change? particularly if you're helping your kids, and this is a big one, you're helping your kids, and maybe there's a, there's a spouse or a, or a boyfriend or girlfriend that maybe you're not 100% about. Um, if something does happen in that relationship, it will drag you into the financial area of it. So we wanna be cautious about simply going co-ownership co unless we know exactly what the, fi the family dynamics are and whether that's gonna be acceptable to you. Um, there'll be also you know buyout agreements and so on and so forth so that there is a way that you can make sure that this is a smooth and, and open uh, process for you and your family members. The, the, the new one that just came out, which is pretty exciting for a lot of people at Booster, because I think, and I may be wrong on this, but we may be launching this tomorrow morning, is the, the first homeowner savings account, the first homeowner savings account. So again, this is another way you can help family members um, and yourself, for a matter of fact, or, or younger kids if they're thinking about purchasing a home down the road. Um, 
Very basically, the contributions that you place into this plan are tax deductible. So if you're contributing on behalf of your children, uh, it'll be in their name and their account. You will not get the tax benefit from it. The kids will. Um, all the growth in this is tax-free, um, like your RSP, which is wonderful. Um, the annual limit right now is $8,000 a year. And that may change because it's the first year, but it's $8,000 for this year. And the maximum you can contribute to this plan is $40,000. So it, it, it's enough in there to at least give uh, family members a leg up when it comes to having to pay for down payments. And I said previously, having to pay for things like expenses um, on the home purchase. One of the things that, that um, is really interesting about the product is that uh, if for some reason this product is not used, a first home is not purchased, this can be attributed um, without room to, to the, the, the family member's RRSP. So to me, this is, this is, this is a win-win proposition because it allows you to contribute to your, if you're going to help your family member with growing their wealth on the, on, with the first home savings account. And that will obviously involve lots of conversation, lots of discussion. And if at the end of the day, the decision is made not to purchase a home, you're actually helping them contribute to their retirement plan. So a, this is this to me is one of these w big win-win um, plans that the government has brought out, and, I, and you can come into any financial office of Blue Shore, and we'll be able to set this up with you. And I believe this will all start next week. Um, I do have a question for those out there, if you wouldn't mind answering. This is: Do you have any further um, interest in exploring the first home savings account? As part of an, a legacy, as part of um, helping your kids uh, with building the finances to purchase a home. So if you'd be kind enough to, to hit A, B, or C, that would be greatly appreciated. Okay, so we'll close, the, we'll close it and we will uh, have a look at what we've got here. And the answer is evenly yes and no. Um, so for those of you, of course, that would like further information, uh, please give us a shout, give your advisor a shout or someone at Blue Shore will be able to get more information to you. Um, and hopefully for those that said no, you've already seen a lot of this information in the newspaper um, and other financial institutions, which are also building their portfolio back, uh, platform out as well. So the, the, next, the next little slide I wanna do is grow in your wealth. So th this is a really important aspect of using uh, using proper products, using proper information, using proper planning to grow what you've you've saved and what you've you've been able to develop in your life. And so part of that really revolves around getting some expert advice. And you know what really is wealth? When we talk about wealth, uh, really it's a few things. it's it's any real estate you have. It's any investable assets that you might have. If you have a family business, the the cash value, the money in the family business, um, any collections that you have, whether you're a car collector or whether you're maybe in a watch collector, all these um, really become what is really called your net worth or your wealth. And this will determine roughly, you know, can, the big question is, you know, can I give any money away? Can I afford to give any money away? And by sitting down with a, um, an advisor, um, they have lots, we have lots of experience in dealing with estate planning and building portfolio, building wealth, retirement planning, that we can help you out um, with lots of different um, uh, products and tools that are very catered to your specific needs. And that's really important because we don't want to be just cookie cutter. You buy a mutual fund and we leave it alone. We want to be along with that journey with you. And in my mind, it's a win. If we've helped you get towards your goals and to your goals, then we've done our job here at Blue Shore. And I think we've got enough talent here that I would really highly recommend you pop in and talk to your, your local uh, financial advisor. All advisors here do have professional credentials, CFP, PFP, and a reminder that we, we the holders of these need to upgrade and upgrade these every year. So it's something that we're constantly on top of and making sure that we understand anything new in the marketplace. And of course, understanding markets, products, needs, what's out there, changes to legislation, new products that are available, products that are being discounted. These are really important because there's so, there, there is so much financial noise out there that you need someone to at least bring it down to a simple, understandable plan. And that's what we can do here for you. 
So, so um, what I'm going to do next is just turn to this slide here, which really says that Canadians who have worked for 15 years or more with a financial advisor can have from two to nearly four times more than without an advisor. And that's simply, it, it's, it, it's, it's not some panacea. It's simply somebody has your back and is working with you in a way that fits your financial situation. So it's really important, again, to connect with a planner. Now, I am now going to turn the slides over to Andre, and Andre is going to talk to you about protecting your wealth. Andre. Thank you, Phil, and thank you for having me tonight, uh, today. So I, I wanted to, to briefly touch on um, some of the, the products that, that you can use from, from risk protection, but also looking at ways to uh, protect your family from whether that be taxes or inflation protection, et cetera. And, and insurance is quite unique in that there are some products that are available uh, outside of the kind of traditional uh, planning. So when it comes to, to insurance, I think for a lot of people, when they think of life insurance, they think of of uh, risk protection, you know, your traditional planning, whether that be protecting a mortgage or, or a liability if somebody were to prematurely pass. But there are some pretty unique products out there that are available that actually uh, combine the life insurance need as well as an investment component that has some unique tax benefits and that the investments can actually grow without having to worry about any capital gains as they're sheltered within the within the life insurance policy. And secondly, life insurance does pay to your beneficiaries, your heirs, outside of wills and outside of probate. So it is a, a, a one-time lump sum payment that um, is not something that would be subject to taxation. So depending on everyone's situation, there may be some, some uh, benefits of looking at insurance from outside of the traditional uh, perspective of, of looking at it to protect, like I said, one of those you know, those debts or mortgages or, or untimely passing. Uh, and I'm going to touch on the specifics on those in, in a second, but I wanted to just kind of cover off what I do here at Blue Shore is, is I work with all of the advisors and we look at um, everyone's kind of unique situation uh, to, to provide potential solutions that could work, whether that be life insurance. We also look at disability insurance and critical illness insurance. And, and those types of products are are structured what we would call as living benefits. Life insurance obviously doesn't pay to yourself, it pays to a, to a beneficiary of your choice. But with disability insurance, essentially how that works is that's gonna pay a monthly benefit if you can't do the regular duties of your occupation. So it's designed to replace your income during your working years. And that does not have to be necessarily a, an illness, it can be an injury. Essentially, if a doctor says you can't do the regular duties of your occupation, that would pay you that living benefit. And, and you know, for some people, it's nice that they may have a, a group plan through their work or their employer that would offer that type of coverage, but that may not be something that's available to everybody, uh, especially if you're, a, say, a business owner or business for self. Um, that may be something you'd want to look at personally to, to provide for yourself. Critical illness insurance is, is similar that it does provide that uh, benefit to yourself as a living benefit. And how it's structured a little bit differently than disability is that it would pay a one-time lump sum payment to yourself if you became critically ill. And there are 23 illnesses that are covered, but the big three that we call it would be cancer, heart attack, or stroke. Those actually represent about 95% of all the claims for critical illness. So that is that is generally the, the, the big players there. And essentially you have to survive 30 days from the diagnosis of that illness, and then it would pay that lump sum benefit. Designed to be used to kind of help while you're in your recovery stages of that illness, um, to maybe uh, take care of additional costs associated with that illness. Maybe you need to hire some help or, or make some modifications to your home, et cetera. But those products can actually work uh, mutually beneficial to each other. So if you became critically ill, you would receive a, a benefit, but also if, if that illness caused you to be off work, then you would actually start to receive those disability payments while, while you're off work. Disability insurance is designed to replace that lost income during your working years. So it does stop at age 65, even if you were considered disabled. The insurance companies, I guess, determine everybody retires at age 65. So we, we probably need to look at updating that in the future. But as of today, that's essentially how uh, those products work. But looping back to the, the life insurance, 
I think the, the main two types are, are term insurance and whole life or permanent insurance. And the way term insurance is, it works is you, you lock in that rate for a specific time period, and it's usually either 10 years or 20 years. And then at the end of that term, the policy is going to renew and your premiums are going to jump. And they usually jump pretty significantly. It's usually around, you know, a se seven to 10 times premium from what you were paying previously. So not designed as a long term type strategy. It's really more I've got a short term need while the kids are young or while I've still got a mortgage to, to take care of anything if, if I were to pass away prematurely. Uh, most people buy term insurance and it's mainly, I, I would kind of liken it to like fire insurance for your house. Uh, hopefully you never, you never use it, but it's nice to know that there's that peace of mind that it's there and, and it's relatively affordable. Uh, when it's, when we're looking at, at, uh, permanent strategies, that's where these whole life policies can come into place. And essentially the main difference is with a, with a permanent plan is that benefit will pay eventually the day that you pass away. So it's a guaranteed benefit that's going to pay to, to your beneficiaries. Now, there are different ways to structure it. You can have a really basic type plan where you've got a, a policy that does not have any cash values, does not have any growth, but it's a fixed amount for the rest of your life. And that might be designed for people that, let's say there's a, a family, family cottage or cabin that, that we want to maintain and we want to keep in the family. But some of the concerns with that is that you know, if you bought a place in, in Whistler in, in the late 70s, that's had some significant growth over the last 40, 50 years. And one of the concerns with that is if it's not your primary residence, uh, there would be some capital gains that would be owed on that property upon the transfer of ownership, whether that be to your children. And one of the one of the concerns would be, well, how do we take care of that capital gains if, if, um, if my children are are you know at, at that stage in their lives where they've got their own mortgages or they've got their own children that they're looking at providing for how are we going to come up with the capital to actually take care of that liability and that's where insurance can be put in place to to essentially cover off that tax liability and working backwards is saying well what is it going to cost me in premium to provide that that tax uh, that that eventual liability and it usually works out to be a little bit cheaper than actually just cutting a check to CRA or having to maybe take out a, a loan to cover that cost. So that's one planning option. One of the other options is looking at policies that do have some cash values that grow over time within those policies. And the benefit with that is that it grows within the policy without having to pay any capital gains. And secondly, it's actually going to increase your life insurance coverage as it goes along. So it's actually purchasing more life insurance throughout those years. So for clients that are looking at ways to diversify their portfolio, maybe they've, they are trying to keep their, their income levels low or they're, they're in high marginal tax brackets. How do we look at maybe some alternative solutions to help minimize my taxes while I'm living, but also provide a, a nice, flexible, uh, quick, outside of complicated trusts, et cetera, to have a, a payment that would go to my beneficiaries 100% tax-free and outside of wills and probates. And that, that's one key thing for a lot of our families that we're working with. We may deal with families that have maybe blended families. We've got children from previous, previous marriages, et cetera, uh, concerned about maybe estate equalization. We wanna make sure that children from previous relationships are entitled to some benefits. Um, it, it, it can always obviously get uh, quite, um, quite complicated when you're dealing with with family dynamics etc and insurance can be a nice way to to equalize the states whether one child maybe has has no care for the cabin but maybe one child does maybe one child could be gifted the cabin upon upon the estate transfer maybe one child would would rather have an estate equalization through an insurance policy so essentially when we meet with clients we kind of look at at everybody's situation and, and come up with options that might be beneficial to them to see whether this might be something that would fit within the plan. And, and for us, it's really kind of bringing options to the table that maybe people haven't heard of before. And maybe um, uh, moving aside from some of the, the uh, preconceptions with insurance, I think for a lot of people, they're, they're uh, maybe thinking about products or, or features that, that uh, might have been in previous iterations of the plans and things have changed quite dramatically over the last 20, 30 years. And insurance companies understand that um, that, that clients' needs have changed over, over the, the number of years. And, and 
utilizing those benefits and, and looking at the entire financial picture is, is where I kind of come in working with your financial advisors as well as potentially your investment advisors to find solutions that, that may work for you, whether that's uh, personally owned or whether that's corporately owned. There's lots of different ways that we can structure policies that uh, might just be something that can supplement your existing planning to, uh, to provide a diversification. And that's, that's essentially where I come in is to, to have a look at, at everyone's situation to see if there may be some planning in place that can be beneficial for them. So with that, uh, I can pass that back over to Phil and, and, uh, and he can take it from there. Great, thank you, Andre. Thanks for that, that on insurance, that was great. Um, and certainly it enhances that, that planning aspect that we are available to do here at, at Blue Shore. So really right now, we're just gonna talk about gifting some of the wealth. And I'm sure part of the, the big question really is, you know, how much, how much do I have? What is, what's the value of my estate? How much do I wanna give away? How much do I wanna to give to people? And who do I want to give it to? And this is a really interest, interesting little stats by the Law Society. 75% of Canadians um, delete one or more members of the family in their will. So it's, it's, as Andre said, it's not always clear exactly what's going to happen from the will perspective. And, and the final one is, when can I do this? When should I do this? And again, that's really where you need that basic plan to figure out what the timing of it. But there's, one, is, one is something very, um, very interesting that's becoming more common these days, is gifting while you're alive. And that is providing families and intergenerational um, uh, wealth transfers while you're alive. Now, of course, there, in most situations, this is not a tax event. This is money out of your pocket. Um, you will not be involved in probate fees or probate delays, so that can be done. Um, you'll be able to make more detailed uh, uh, decisions with, the, with the, the transfers because you'll be dealing with other family members who are alive. Um, the, the, there are some personal risks because if you do it too much currently, you you're personally you may run into some creditor issues or you may run out of money. And that is a really serious question that you need to talk to an advisor about. The other one is once you've given the money to the family members, you will lose control. It's the family members that will have it. But if you think of it in a very um, more of a, uh, a kind of a, a positive way in terms of what is what is your legacy with the family? Um, I love things like, you know, um, gifts of income. Um, uh, in other words, if you have a, particularly a, a family member who may, be, may spend too much and you're concerned about giving them large lump sums of money, um, then you may want to be able to provide monthly income for them. So that may be one way of doing that. The second one might be you know, gifts and experiences like taking cruises or trips while you're alive with, with the family. That doesn't mean you have to do it all now, but it's, it's, it, for some people it's much better to have that experience with their family um, to be a good role model with them uh, before you pass, unfortunately. Um, the other way of doing it, which is very traditional, is using the will. And and really, um, we're just going to go through through one slide here. I'm going to ask you, um, we're doing the will, sorry about that. And I'm going to ask you a little bit of a question here. Um, do you have an estate plan? And if you do have an estate plan, do you know where it is? Um, if you'd be kind enough, just quickly answer A, B, or C, I would greatly appreciate it. I'll leave it open for about 10 seconds. Okay, so I'm just going to close the poll. We're going to have a quick look at it. And very even. So it's um, uh, some of, half of you do and half of you don't. I um, highly recommend that for the other half that don't, um, please talk to a planner or an advisor and, and start that process. Um, so the other and the final way that we, we typically will transfer wealth is upon death. So very quickly going through that, you'll need, uh, it's good to have a sort of an estate plan in place, um, understanding uh, uh, how you want your assets divvied up through the will, and that's really critical. Um, you'll be involved in probate fees. There'll be deemed disposition on your portfolio and there'll be deemed disposition on your registered plans. And all that money will go into an estate account 
um, where you'll get the letters of probate and that will really clear your state for um, transfer to your beneficiaries. Um, one thing to please take away from this presentation, it is very important for you to have the basics at this point. If your intent is that you're going to leave it until you pass to give way to the family, family members, or possibly even a charity, um, remember to have your will in place and make sure it's updated. If it's more than 10 years old, your asset value has probably changed quite dramatically. Um, also make sure you have a power of attorney in place. Now a power of attorney allows someone uh, should you get ill, should you be incapacitated for a little while, to take over your financial affairs. And that's really important. We're, it, life is fairly complicated right now, and it's not, it, nothing is that easy when it comes to finances. And so by giving a power of attorney, someone you trust, um, that role, they can take over for you um, should you become uh, ill. And the final one really is very becoming very popular right now is a representation agreement. And that simply allows someone in your family or outside your family to take care of you uh, and make medical decisions for you. Really important because simply some people uh, have very specific needs and roles when they, when they do get sick, they, they wanna follow a certain path. So it's important to have that representation agreement. And then the final one is to really just, if you've got your will, pull it out again, have a look at it and see who you've put in as the executor of your will. That will be the person that collects all the data on your will and make sure it's someone that's still alive someone that you trust um, and someone that you know will be willing to do the job for you. So at this point, um, I wanna thank you for listening to this part of it and we're going to turn over uh, the remainder to Jesse, but one final comment I would make, if, if this is of great interest to you, please pop in and have a look at, and have a chat with your Blue Shore financial advisor. Over to Jesse. Thank you, Phil and Andre, for sharing your expert advice. I know I myself have gained a few insightful pieces of information to consider for my own legacy planning to take away after today. I hope this webinar will encourage you to speak with your loved ones about your own financial plan and having the right advice can help. Remember, your wealth and health are connected. You, your family, your advisor working together can create the plan and the future you all deserve and desire. And so it's important to know you're not alone in this. I'd love to encourage you to sit down with an advisor, as mentioned, to build a plan, ensuring it's on track as you grow and change, and as well as having a plan on how to protect your wealth and your family's interests to weather anything that comes your way. I would now love to open up the floor to pick Andre's and Phil's brain a little bit more and some, answer some of the questions that was sent into our Q&A throughout the webinar. Now, the first one, which I'd love to direct to Phil, um, can you explain a bit more on power of attorneys? And does that require a lawyer or can I write one on my own? Um, thanks, Jesse. Um, the power of attorney should not really be done in, in isolation. It should be part of your will and your representation agreement, yes. You should really um, see a lawyer or a notary to write that in and have someone in, in, that you know. Um, oftentimes, some of the banks and some of the financial institutions will take, they'll have their own power of attorney um, page that you can fill out while you're in the branch. But I would highly recommend, just because life is, is complex, that you, you do this through a notary or through a, a full lawyer. Thank you, Phil. Um, we have another one which is quite timely with our new FHSA. Um, the question I mainly to Phil, but I think maybe Andre, you could add a little bit of insight as well. Um, the question is, can I open a FHSA for my kids now or do they have to do it on their own? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly take that and, and, and Andre jump in if you have any further. Uh, further ideas on this. Well, for, firstly, the, the, you can do that now. The, the, the child has to be 18 years of age. That's the beginning part of it. it has to be a Canadian citizen. So yes, it can be started now. Um, and the real goal is to have that funds by the time the child is ready to purchase a new or a brand new home. Andre, do you have any ideas on that one? Okay. Okay, Jesse, but that's uh, that's 
that I think. Well, Phil, you are on a roll because we have another question for you. Yeah. Um, and the question is, how often should I review basically in my will and estate plan? That's a great question. Um, you know, I have the privilege of dealing with clients um, on a regular basis where we get to a fairly um, deep and emotional relationship about their finances. And so oftentimes that will is brought up twice a year in the context of any changes that may happen, life events that may happen. So an easy answer would be probably once a year. Have a look at it. Make sure all the names in it are what you want. Um, because really, the, the, it's unusual. Usually when, when someone gets sick, that the will is kind of the last thing they're thinking about. It's more about getting healthy. And then the, the best part, the, honestly, the best part is if you can have a relationship with your advisor, um, that you can bring all this to the table and really update things. Because again, some of your finances may have changed. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Now, Andre, this question's for you. Um, what would getting insurance look like for someone who's perhaps a little older and would it be difficult? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think a lot of people would be surprised at um, how uh, the insurance underwriting works. Now, at the end of the day, life insurance is, is something that there is an underwriting process that is basically uh, subject to your, to your health. Um, now, I think for, for a lot of people, they may view that, uh, well, you know, I may be in my late 50s, early 60s, or maybe even early 70s, and I've got a few health concerns. Maybe I've got some high blood pressure, medication, maybe cholesterol levels, et cetera. Um, insurance companies underwrite people based on their age at the time of application. So, you know, they're, they're looking at the average individual at that time. So somebody that's, that's in their late 60s that's taking blood pressure medication, that's pretty common. As long as things are, are under control or they have a little bit of history with, with the, the health issues, um, it, it generally isn't something that would be prohibitive. I think, you know, if, if somebody was, was 21 years old and was on blood pressure medication, that might be something that they would view a little bit differently than somebody that's a little bit older. And when we're looking at at planning processes for for uh, for people that are uh, a little bit older, um, in a lot of instances, we're looking at policies that would be joint between spouses. Essentially, we're looking at policies that really are only going to pay that benefit when the last spouse passes away, because that's when the estate transfer is going to take place, and that's when the tax consequences would be potentially due. And, and, and in a lot of instances, uh, our assets will transfer to our spouse. Uh, tax-free with, with some of the rollover provisions CRA allows us. So in that instance, when we're looking at life insurance policies and we're doing them jointly, actually only one spouse needs to be insurable from that standpoint. And um, so I, I think for a lot of people, they, they may be surprised at, at how uh, available these products are, even considering there may be a few health issues. At, at, so it, it's not something that would prohibit you uh, in the, it, from, from looking at, looking at it, applying for an option there. Thank you, Andre. It's it's amazing to know that you know there's there's always options, um, and they can work with you closely. Now, to go into a bit more specifics, um, can you share if it's possible to switch to a term from sorry if it's possible to switch from a term life policy into a whole life policy? Yeah, and that that's that's one of the benefits of getting a policy in your earlier years is is once you've got a plan in place. They can never take it away from you. So I usually recommend to people to to at least get some type of policy in place while you're while you're young and you're you're insurable because we can always relook at them in the future. So that that concept of moving a, a term policy to a permanent policy would be what's called a conversion, and that uh, does not require any medicals. So for somebody that maybe bought a policy when they were in their 40s, maybe they bought a term 20 policy and it's it's it has served its purpose. But there are circumstances of change, and maybe they've got, you know, more long-term goals, or or they're they're looking at uh, t some tax planning. You can actually convert those policies to permanent policies with really just signing some paperwork. There's no medical, so even if your health has changed, let's say as an example, you bought a policy when you were in your 40s, and maybe now you've got a heart condition, or or you've had maybe you had cancer at some point. You can actually convert those term policies to permanent policies without having to do any medical declarations. It's really just a form to switch. 
So that's that is something where we always recommend to to relook at the policies that you've got, look at those provisions, but um, maybe looking at at potential options to to make some switches as, as your life circumstances change. So um, it, it's always a good idea to to relook at those plans. And uh, if you've got policies in place and your health has changed, we may not be uh, prohibited from from looking at, at at permanent solutions in the future. There. This really highlights the importance of having those annual reviews with your planner and advisor um, where they can really take a look at what's changed and, you know, pulling in Andre, you as the specialist to provide, you know, additional support if need be. Um, now, this question goes to Phil. If you can provide some insight into trust accounts, you know, how do they work? When is it beneficial? Some of the pros and cons. Sure. Um, there, there are many types of trust accounts, but if we just look at it simply, it is a legal account that's set up, but it can be set up at a financial institution where your funds go into a trust account for, some, for, for a particular reason. Let's say this is for estate planning. This is where maybe you have a, this example would be where you have maybe a, a complicated family situation. You personally don't want to be too involved in the distribution of assets. And you can do the trust before your death or after your death. It can be opened up either way. Um, it is run by the trustee. So the trustee um, will follow your guidelines as to how the, the trust will be used. So you can set it up that you pay certain people in the family X amount of dollars until the trust runs out. So it is a legally set up agreement um, that we can certainly open for you here. Um, and then really the real key to it is making sure because you do lose some control yourself, there might be tax going into the trust, depending on what you're putting into the trust, for example, real estate. Um, and at that point, you've really got to decide what you want the benefit of the trust to be going down the road. And I see it more often when it's a complicated family situation, as Andre said, multiple generations, multiple families, uh, where you know nobody's on the same page. And this way, it, it leaves you out of, this, out of the actual decision-making process once you've decided. And it, in the context of, you know, whether it's estate planning or wealth transfer, would you suggest that it's better to leave real estate to the grandchildren instead of their own children to keep a property within that family? That's a really great question. If you're being on the North Shore, this is the, the topic that constantly goes on. Um, one, of the, one of the challenges with the increase in real estate values on the North Shore, in particular, let's say the Lower Mainland, is when you're passing it to your family, you want to make sure that they can afford to continue to, to keep it up. And so if you're passing real estate to a grandchild, and we see this now a lot in my business, but more importantly, leaving money to the grandchildren and not to the, the, the children. So they're passing their wealth to the next generation. Um, I think that would be a real big discussion to have uh, with your kids to decide whether this would work out, whether they're, if, if, it's, if it's just a single child, then that's, that's a fairly easy and uncomplicated situation. If you have multiple children, that one may not want to have anything to do with the property that you're you're passing on, then how are we going to how are we going to balance the, the the money that's gone out of the portfolio? So the idea is very good. I like it, uh, but you've got to be prepared to really talk to the kids about how ongoing it's going to be funded by the grandchildren. So there are possible. Andre, Andre um, kind of indicated you can put an insurance plan together that will pay out down the road to the grandkids, which will help them fund a property but it's really about you don't want to be handing someone a piece of real estate that they can't afford to keep up and so that generally is the thing but again it, this is a planning discussion because if you have other assets around this may not be as a big issue as, as maybe it might be if you only have the home as your asset hope that helps Thank you so much to both Phil and Andre for providing so much insight. Um, there, there was some really great questions. Um, I think there might have been a couple which we weren't able to get to, but we'll make sure to loop back and, and follow up and make sure we answer those questions. 
and most definitely, you know, reach out to your financial advisor, reach out to one of our advisors at Blue Shore. Um, we'd love to discuss, you know, your questions and, and help you with those concerns. Now, this concludes our presentation. Um, before we sign off, we will be sending out the recording tomorrow to all of you. And we would really love your feedback to our webinar today. If you look at the bottom of your screen, there is a clipboard icon um, at the very bottom there. I believe it's the fourth to the right. Um, so if you can take some time before leaving the webinar to answer um, and fill out our survey, it would be greatly appreciated. Now, thank you again for joining. Andre, Phil, and myself today, we, we would love to see you in one of our financial spas very soon. Take care. <laughs>